Um, so, you know, many of you know um, that I've been the closing speaker, and I will confess it gets much more difficult every year to come up with something that is, um, I think the word used earlier was irreverent, maybe entertaining, shocking, um, but I hope always thought-provoking and perhaps even inspiring. But I will do my best, so please indulge me. And as I thought about this, you know, it's, it's been a long time that we've been coming together. Um, many of us have been coming together for the last 29 years. And um, it is an, an absolutely unique conference, which is why I think so many of us keep coming back year after year after year. It's one of the few times, for example, when I was on Wall Street, where I didn't have a whole host of competitors around me. I didn't have to think about what was going to be written the next morning by those competitors and how could I find something more inspiring to say or more interesting or more relevant that would be paid for than my competitors. But instead, I learned. And I learned an awful lot about what the state of our healthcare system was from the people who were actually making it happen. Um, and I've been really privileged and honored to be asked back so many times as your closing speaker. Um, but this has also been a personally important conference. I've had a lot of life changes that have happened on this conference. I end up you know, losing one job, getting another job. Um, I brought my family with us. And um, like me, I think a lot of you, um, we've, we've kind of grown up together in this conference. And we've seen health, our families change. We've seen the university mature and invest in healthcare and invest in the business and practice of healthcare in a way that I think is distinctive and interesting and, and um, thought provoking about how healthcare should be taught and how healthcare education can change some of the landscape that we deal with every day in healthcare. Um, as a group, we've changed, and as individuals, we've changed. But healthcare, the topic we come to discuss every year, does not seem to have changed terribly much we're still talking about some of those very same issues we spoke about the first time I came in front of you as a young, starry-eyed, still somewhat cynical, sarcastic, irrelevant, controversial, whatever adjective you want to use, analyst, okay? <laughs> and that's despite a number of really interesting and perhaps even momentous changes that have occurred over that 29-year period. Um, so let me just recap for you 29 years of healthcare major events. We've had major legislation, so BBA 97 and the, its two subsequent fixes. Um, this is alphabet soup, so apologies if you don't know, you know, let's just make notes of the alphabet and look them up. Um, <laughs> Medicare Modernization Act, MMA, hold that thought for a second, I'll have a comment about that. MACRA, Let's not forget the ACA, or as it started out first, PPACA, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, um, the 21st Century Cures Act, and a whole host of other budget reconciliation, OBRA, and OBRA acts, et cetera, okay? Major legislative initiatives that have changed the landscape of healthcare. Um, the thought around the Medicare Modernization Act, just sort of in my role of recapping and closing out the conference, those of you who were here when Liz Fowler was on the panel yesterday actually heard something really, really important. Liz Fowler and Dean Rosen were the two opposing sides, or you know, in those days they were, they were cordial opposition. She, um, the Senate finance lead um, health care counsel for the uh, Democrats, and Dean Rosen, the Senate lead for Bill Frist and the Republicans. And they were the two people who got into that smokeless room and hammered out what they could get done that made Medicare prescription drug coverage possible. So when Liz Fowler, lovely, brilliant, unassuming as she is, stands up here and says to you, it needs work. It needs to be fixed. She knows from whence she speaks. And in the old days, legislation got done with the anticipation of don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You can always come back and build on it later. Fast forward to our friend Norm, and we're learning that no, that's not the way it works. But that was an important moment where an actual person who actually changed healthcare tremendously in healthcare stood up here and said, 
We need to get it fixed and to encourage those who are on the panel to get it done the right way for seniors and those of us who are approaching seniorhood um, to actually have a benefit that works for all of us. So it's an important conference. Next item on the agenda. There have been major changes in health care and the way we pay for it and access it over the lifespan of this conference. Okay, so starts in 1992. About a decade later, consumer-directed, high-deductible, HSA-linked, health savings account-linked health plans were introduced. Why? Let's not forget why. Third-party payment system. Anyone in the room old enough to remember what a third-party payment system was and what a challenge it presented for this industry? For those of us as consumers, we didn't pay for our health care. And we would sit here in this room and we would discuss how do we get skin in the game for the consumer so they can make better, more intelligent, more informed choices and be a participant in, I told you we said the same things, and be a participant in the healthcare decision-making process. Okay? And out of that came high deductibles, HSAs, consumer-directed plans, and the situation of affordability that we're now in. Okay? Because demand is infinite when price is zero. PhD economist, told you that. <laughs> okay? But we've also had a move towards Medicare Advantage, replacing Medicare Plus Choice. And I gotta tell you, I'm actually looking forward to being on a Medicare Advantage plan. Because it pretty much covers anything, and I pretty much have very low copays. I don't have a $6,000 deductible <laughs> like I do right now. Okay? I'm looking forward to it. Not the age, but the coverage. <laughs> Manage Medicaid, which arguably, especially for the dually eligible, both Medicaid and Medicare, can do wondrous things in bringing together what is a complex opposing system of regulation and coverage and financial rules. Okay? And then we've, of course, had work requirements, which may or may not stay. And then we've had the fall and rise of pharmacy benefit management companies. And now the question, of course, of whether or not they are going to transform into what we think it should be, which is a pharmacy care services company. There have been major clinical advances. I mean, just think about TAVR, right? So you can now come up through a blood vessel and replace a heart valve, okay? When Edwards was here putting that little funky looking ring on the screen and talking to us about what a life changing event, literally and figuratively, that was here at this conference. And that was one of the seminal changes in healthcare. Okay, so just a reminder. We've had robotic surgeries. I got to tell you, when that Da Vinci robot comes at you, it's really quite an experience. <laughs> Routine joint replacements, okay? Who would have thought 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we'd not only be doing hip and knee replacements routinely, but outpatient? Don't tell me things haven't changed in healthcare. They have really changed in healthcare, okay? Um, and then we've made very significant strides in cancer and major scientific advantage, advances, mapping the genome, et cetera, that we have not even begun to deploy for the benefit of those we serve who need our care in healthcare. Now, we've also seen some partnerships to fix healthcare come and go, okay? So we've seen, for example, the Healthcare Transformation Alliance. We've seen a ton of um, mergers of hospital systems. I seem to recall one in the San Francisco area where parties got divorced. I mean, they're, and they're not alone. We've seen a lot of attempts to consolidate, streamline, whatever the, in, the intent was of those transactions. We've seen a lot of attempts um, to create partnerships. And we've seen employers and employer groups, the Pacific Northwest, I remember when GE had one, when you know, GE was a company that United Health Group used to emulate because it was bigger. Now it's not. So you know, th things change, but the whole notion of how we go about fixing healthcare Maybe there's not so much new under the sun, but they were attempts that happened during the course of lifespan of this conference. And technology is no longer present only in medical devices and office PCs, right? It's omnipresent, even if it still isn't as advanced as it could be. And still, let's take a moment to appreciate how far we've come with technology. We can now, instead of taking blood from an artery, 
you can put a little clip on the end of your finger and get your blood oxygenation levels. Every time that's done to me, I'm thrilled. <laughs> that's in advance, okay? And now we can have a continuous glucose monitor monitoring our glucose and ambient technology and the computing and data analysis that comes after that, little big brother-ish, but maybe it's worth it, okay? <laughs> coming in and making sure that when we fall down, we get help, and maybe when we're about to fall down, there's some intervention. All of these things have happened. Yet, despite all of that, and all of the attempts we've had to fix healthcare, you saw some of them in the, mo in the most recent presentation of the strategic um, combinations and the new initiatives and all of the rest of that. All the collaborations, all of the partnerships that have gone on, all the research and scientific discovery and insights from data that we now have, you have to ask the question that why is it that healthcare still costs too much? It still doesn't really satisfy anyone in the system. It's still incredibly disconnected, disjointed, and still has too much variation in care. And why is it that healthcare records are still not portable? And if they are portable, because actually I can pull up my phone and not that I'm going to, but I could show you my individual health record through my MyUHC site. Okay, we have it as employees, but it's not complete. And why are tests, as you heard earlier today, still duplicated? And why as a patient do I have to add, enter my name and my social security number and answer the same questions over and over and over again during one, just one office visit? Never mind multiple sites of care. Just one office business, a stack of forms this big, okay? And in this deeply digital age, why on earth do providers still send their prior authorization requests to United Healthcare and pretty much every other payer on the planet by fax? <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of faxes every year. And you want to know why healthcare costs too much and we don't have information? Stop sending faxes. Now that I have your attention. <laughs> so we know why the healthcare system doesn't work for everyone, okay? We know that it's disconnected data. We know that it is a supply chain problem. We know that it's a lack of common language and clinical and communication standards, and we know that we've been attempting to solve the same problem over and over again, sometimes in exactly the same way. And we expect a different result every time. And we have misaligned and incorrect financial statements. In other words, and this is just a small, small clip art of all of the reasons why healthcare is broken. And the answers, therefore, are many, and they're not very satisfying. And sometimes they're very complex. But what I see as someone who works now in, to build strategic relationships and partnerships to fix healthcare, and as someone who's participated in this discussion here and elsewhere for more than 30 years, there is really only one fundamental root cause. And that is that healthcare lacks a common language common standards, a common infrastructure, an agreement around all of those. And to be blunt, healthcare is not a system at all. Healthcare is a collection of singularities. They are silos, and they're silos of capability, of mission, of purpose, innovations, treatment, and outcomes. And those silos don't exactly trust one another do they? Nor does the regulatory or legal environment necessarily help break down and connect the singularities that are the healthcare economy. 
Now you can think about why healthcare is a collection of singularities, why we are so distinct from pretty much every other industry that we touch within healthcare, whether it's you know an employer group that buys the buys services from us, or it's a patient's employer, or it's other industries that come to us and want to transform and disrupt us. And part of that is because we grew up as a cottage industry. If you think about healthcare was how healthcare was provided initially, how some of the first hospitals got started, it was a physician who had space in his home to take care of patients who needed them overnight. We're a cottage industry that's not particularly well financed. It's not was never structured from the get-go to be an integrated network of circuits. Healthcare is deeply social. It requires human interaction, which is by its very nature complex and difficult to model and streamline and standardize. And it's also deeply personal. Everyone's an exception. So we understand this. But as a result of that being a collection of singularities and the legacy that we inherited that never allowed the system to stop and invest the money on integration and commonality where it made sense. The industry has ended up becoming repetitive and it's also competitive because every time someone fails to see a solution that works specifically for them in their little silo, they go out and replicate some service. So in answer to the question this morning about why can't I find out which of my patients is going to be in the ER? And the answer that you got was go ahead and keep, keep developing your own thing in-house. I would say to you, no. I would say to you, that's a call for all of the people like an Optum and like others. And by the way, yes, we are working on precisely that issue for precisely that reason, because you should know which of your patients are at risk and who you should pull in to see as a physician, because they need you most. Okay? This is what we're working on. But assuming that you didn't know that, we need to do a better job as healthcare information technologists and data scientists of letting everybody else know what we are working on and developing that common language and that com those common standards. It's simply not good enough to continue being what we are and behaving the way we have been. We cannot continue to fail to agree on a common language. We need to be a connected system. And we need it now even more than ever because of the affordability crisis that my colleagues on the panel have talked about, as have others. And it's very, very real. It's driving political and regulatory action, and it's driving those who need care farther away from those who can provide it. We also need a sense of urgency, okay? The one thing that was a little disappointing to me yesterday was the sort of lack of sense of urgency. Okay, folks, I've said this to you before, we have no time to waste. We need to drive towards a connected healthcare system with a connected path and begin to agree on those things we can agree on. The only way we're going to do that is through an increased use of partnership and collaborations. And they can take some really interesting, dynamic, and new forms, and we need to be open and creative about how we do that. So I did sign the form about the fact that there would be a little bit of advertising here, because I can't talk about this without talking about what I do at Optum and United Health Group. So I'm sure you have some questions about what's Optum up to, so now I'm going to, this is the where I answer it part. <laughs> and I don't know how much more I'll be able to say on it because I'm saying everything I pretty much think I should say, okay? Because we're just a little competitive too. Um, so we at Optum and United Health Group have recognized um, the critical importance of connecting these singularities. It is actually um, one of the most important initiatives that we are working on as um, an enterprise is our interoperability initiative. Um, and we know that we cannot do it alone. We have to connect with and seek to connect with, partner with, align with all parts of the healthcare economy. 
So I will remind you, even though I am in blue today, do you like this? <laughs> I made this. Um, lots of plain time. Point is, point is, even though I'm in blue today, United Health Group's color is blue, which is why I'm in blue today. I'm not orange and I'm not light blue and gray, okay? So even though we are a payer and a services company together, we understand the value of that partnership because we are a collaboration with our largest client, Optum's largest client, okay? So we know that if we're going to achieve our vision of a connected, simple, simple and seamless, effective and affordable healthcare system in the future and achieve our mission, we can't do it alone. We have to partner but we also must standardize on a common language and fix healthcare's plumbing and infrastructure problem, which is interoperability. And the lack of those connections from the data flow side in the background that enable all of us to have the best information at the point of care. So we don't need a whole lot more gibberish, and we don't need a whole lot more siloed behavior. We don't need net, yet another individualized, homegrown, although sometimes the homegrowns are important because they do spark something new and creative. And I would argue that if you make it homegrown, let's partner to share it, okay? And let's make sure that we can make it robust. Um, we need more common standards. So I want you to think about something for a second. You all have mobile phones. Those of you who have cars, how do you connect your phone to your car and what would you do if you couldn't? You do it through Bluetooth. Now when Bluetooth came out, I had no idea. What is this? I gotta have a Bluetooth in order to have my phone? What is this, okay? I was not maybe as tech savvy as I should have been. But what the manufacturers of, and, the, and those who are worried about communication protocols did was they got together and standardized on a communication protocol so that everybody who had a cellular phone or a computer or a headset or any other device could instantly connect with any other device no matter who the manufacturer is. Can we do that in healthcare? No. No way, no how. Just because, and worse than that, just because you achieve interoperability with a, another entity or two systems and the data can flow, if, one, if that system is an electronic medical record for a hospital or even some large physician's office, let's just say it's Epic or Cerner or one of the others, you've connected and created interoperability with one instance in one location for one vendor. And by the way, it's not their data, it's mine, as an individual, okay? So this is part of the challenge that we're dealing with. The reality is what I'm talking about is hard to do. It's impossible if you don't have a willing partner of a hospital system or a large physician group or payers or an entity that's willing to bridge the gap and bring all of those people together to solve the communication problem. But we need to have common language and we need common standards. That way, when you do build your own customized for your population application, the data you create will be able to flow seamlessly through those protocols. Everybody will agree on what a data element is. That's up to us to get done. The truth of the matter is we are having some success and there are task force that have been created and there is a regulatory interest, deep interest in interoperability and unlocking data. Cautionary tale is just simply that let's make sure that who's ever invited to the table respects my privacy more than I do and I respect my own privacy a whole lot. So thank you to the person, I don't know if she's still here, of the last panel who asked the question about what about cybersecurity and privacy, okay? Let's make sure everyone who has a seat at this table has the same concern for, for PHI, private health information, for the couple of people I know who don't know what PHI is in the audience. 
um, let's make sure that they have the same level of respect and for it and the, and the mandate to comply with it that every person who operates in healthcare has. That's an important level playing field. As you might expect, we've got a solution for the plumbing problem at Optum. Optum's deploying something called the Optum Data Exchange, which actually was the recasting of an acquisition we did many, many years ago called Axolotl. Some of you may remember that. Um, and it is a modern health information exchange for interoperable data, and we are deploying it within our Optum Care practices. So that what we can do is basically leave the EHR interface alone, but just make sure that that data, that lifeblood of patient care and efficiency flows among all of the entities within the local care delivery system that we are building. And we're deploying it as well to outside partners, wherever we can, because we understand that somebody's got to take the bull by the horns and make sure that this plumbing, this supply chain, this infrastructure problem that we have of a lack of connectivity and a platform with commonality gets solved. And sometimes you just got to step up to the plate and do it. We all need a little bit of courage to get this done. We're partnering to change the structure, financial models, and outcomes in healthcare. We're helping our physician practices both within our own Optum Care practices and those of our partners to make the move into risk-bearing and delegated models. Within our Optum Care geographies, um, we actually know that we're going to own certain of the services and capabilities in that market and certain others we're going to partner with. So, for example, within the confines of the United States, we do not own any hospitals. That probably tells you something. We do own urgent care centers, we do own surgery centers, and we do own physician practices, because you can't own doctors, but we certainly can own the management thereof. Um, and we're going to closely align with some, and we're going to partner with others, and we're going to have contractual relationships with yet others. In short, we will do whatever we need to do to make the experience simple, seamless, smart, effective, and affordable in a local care delivery system. Now, that actually um, requires the process of transforming healthcare sometimes requires an approach to patient care that's unfamiliar to many and that doesn't always mesh with the incentives in a fee-for-service Medicare um, world or even um, in the commercial insurance market. And it requires, of course, not only that data flow real time and is robust with sophisticated analytics, because if you're going to take risk, you better understand everything there is to know, not only about the patients you're serving, but the providers you're referring to, right? Okay. And, an aligned net, and so that aligned network of specialists becomes really important to the equation and must share your common goal of achieving the triple, if not quadruple aim, with more than just lip service, right? Better care, better price, right site, better outcomes, lower costs, all the rest of it. Oh, and better experience for the physician, not just the consumer. So I was really glad to hear earlier today the comments around educational change. And I think that we can't move fast enough, not only to start fresh and new with incoming classes of medical students and other care practitioners and administrators of health care who are now of the digital age, who are... Um, syncing up information that is available from analytics with information that is available from clinical practice and experience. Okay, it's not just the newbies. I think we also need to take the opportunity to work to support those who are already in practice because we can't afford to wait a dozen years. Okay? I also, you know, it was an interesting discussion since I have a little bit of time because Jeff was not was kind enough to give me his half hour. Um, <laughs> I'm almost done. But, but 
you know, I was also interested by the discussion that we had here, and, and I, I know this is, could be a little bit controversial, but that's what they pay me to do here. So the whole notion of what's the role of the physician here, okay? And, you know, as much of an advocate I am for streamlining and making healthcare much, much more effective, um, I'm also a person. And so maybe instead of the three A's, we want to do the three C's of healthcare, connected, collaborate, and compassionate. If physicians become information junkies and they forget to bring their compassion to the exam room, we will not have solved the healthcare problem. Okay? Just a thought. On the other hand, with this explosion of data, analytics, science is driving dramatic change in healthcare. I think that the number is over 12 million pages of research articles of new ideas and concepts in the clinical practice in healthcare, in the, science, in the practice of medicine, come out every year. Who here is a physician who's read all 12 million pages? <laughs> but AI can do that for you, can search for it, and pop up and prompt you on here's some articles that would be very helpful for you for your patient. And also, it can be used to develop new approaches to old disease states. Because you can digest all of that information so quickly, you can coalesce it, you can link it back to what was known, to what is known, and develop new pathways. And yes, we're working on that too. So, I would say that the one thing that we do want to talk about is um, some opportunities and some challenges in addition to the current state. So that's where we're going to move now. So we've got the task force in the industry. Um, we've got um, collaboration by industry participants, some for you know, more broad, more robust, more transformative reasons, and others for survival. Um, because when I hear that hospitals have less than 30 days of cash on hand, what pops in my mind is when are they going to fail? Okay, old healthcare analyst over here, be careful. That's that's a scary number. Um, and you know, for people in those communities, they should be worried about that, um, as should we all. Um, Real-time prior authorization is a really hot button with providers. Okay. And it's not just whether or not, you know, mother may I gets answered right away real time through an interoperable interaction, but is it also tied to payment? Okay. Again, another problem and challenge. You see there's layers of complexity here. It's not just clinical practice and bringing science back into medicine in a way that delivers compassionate care because the doctor now has time to really focus on the patient in front of them as opposed to looking up things for science. A little simplistic, but true. What we're also looking at here is the ability of making that back end of healthcare a whole lot more streamlined, much more cost effective, and more real time. And getting to better diagnoses and outcomes um, to improve health system performance, first make it a system and then make it perform better. The other thing I want to talk about are the technology partnerships. So there's something really interesting um, called the Synaptic Health Alliance for Blockchain. Um, and um, the Synaptic Health Alliance is an alliance of Aetna, Humana, Cognizant, Quest, United Healthcare, Multiplan, and Optum. And the goal here is to use blockchain on what I like to call non-toxic data. It's the provider directory data. And if you think about it, if you're a health plan, if you have a Medicaid plan in a state, and your provider directory is out of date, then access to providers can be extremely limited, and these guys get fined for it. Never mind what happens to the patient who doesn't get care. That's a problem, we understand. But those who are engaged here have the dual notion of, yes, we said we would provide them access, and no, we have no idea where that access is going to come from, because it's really hard to keep provider directories up to date. So it's not toxic data, so it makes it perfect. It's important with a return on investment, um, and um, let's try to see if blockchain works. And the answer is, yeah, blockchain works. But one of the other things that we learned as part of this was that those participants in the Synaptic Health Alliance had to be willing to share some notion of commonality of protocol. Again, a good thing to start on data that's actually essentially publicly available. What's a doctor's name and address? Okay, so it's a good place to practice 
what things can be made standard versus what things need to be proprietary. It's an interesting, uh, and they'll be publishing their results, which I have seen and are positive. Um, and then we can be um, combining capabilities to, um, for care delivery. So we've had the classic combinations, the acquisitions, the M&A, the JVs, the collaborations, the partnerships, and the like. But there's also some strategic relationships that are developing that are symbiotic. And these are the more interesting ones to me, where there's a natural affiliation that is now taking place in the market between providers of like or linked services. And one of them is the alignment between community mental health centers and um, behavioral health specific pharmacies that are either co-located with them or connected to them, whether through information systems or referral relationships or the like. And the outcomes that these folks get by providing a seamless care experience with the outcome that you get your medications in a packaging and in a dose amount that your condition at that moment can handle has resulted in fulfillment rates that are literally double the national average for you know, general medication. So on average, roughly 50% of scripts go un, un, uh, are abandoned at retail pharmacies. 90% of these pharmacies' uh, scripts are picked up by the patient. So that's um, our Genoa Healthcare Pharmacies, and Genoa is a company that we acquired a couple of years ago. Um, and they're growing ra rather rapidly and delivering really um, deeply personalized, deeply humanized care for a population that is rarely treated in that way. So go beyond just putting the script out there. Um, make sure they have food, make sure they have water, make sure they know somebody cares whether or not they're alive. It's that kind of combination, that symbiotic combination of doing what the caregiver needs, making, enabling the caregiver to make sure that the human elements are taken care of and making sure they get the right prescriptions and that they are enhancing their ability to continue to take those prescriptions. That's a, that's a microcosm of the kind of care delivery system that collaboration can build in many aspects of healthcare and in many geographies. Um, partnerships are and have been for some time beginning to move beyond provider to provider alignments um, that you know might complete a continuum of care or fill in gaps and capabilities. So we're seeing, for example, um, combinations or platform kinds of transactions where data analytics, revenue cycle, outpatient community services management, a broader array of services are being delivered um, in partnership with a large provider or health system. Um, and that allows, theoretically, the provider to focus on providing care and managing the clinical and care aspects of the population, while the business services or the, the service and management provider can, func function, uh, can focus on the business of providing health care. In some markets and in some cases, um, that is going to lead to lower cost and better outcome and a better environment um, for folks to actually get care and simplify their experience as well. Um, what it really does is it unites the, that part of the healthcare system on a common set of standards and a common language. And then if you can replicate those things, you're now beginning to solve some of that other problem that I'm worried about, which is that disconnected, um, siloed of um, towers of uniqueness and singularity. Um, but I have to say that you know creating these relationships and nurturing them is really hard work. Um, first of all, we're people, and so there's the social and uh, personal interactions that oftentimes make the difference between whether or not these partnerships work. Um, and then there's also the issue that because all healthcare is local, it's really hard to standardize these, um, these partnerships because every healthcare system you want to par with, partner with, every physician practice you want you acquire is going to say, well, but my healthcare market is different. Okay, it's, you know, it's special because we're in town A versus town B, 
Okay, and to some extent, I would say to the healthcare industry, get over yourself. Sick people are sick people, well people are well people, and providers take care of both. There's a common ground, find it. Um, but when you deal with large organizations, then there's another layer of complexity, which is either called the bureaucracy or the management or the infrastructure or the governance boards. There's a layer of complexity that makes this exceedingly slow. Now, anyone who knows me knows patience is not one of my virtues. I have had to learn it. Because in order to get something good, you sometimes have to be persistent and patient. Um, standardization, obviously not being the hallmark of healthcare, that's another big issue. We've, we're talking about that. That's the core here, that, we're, that message that I want to convey to you. Changing behavior, okay, being a change agent. You want to talk about being controversial and having a difficult job, try being a change agent anywhere you work. Those who want to change embrace you. Those who don't want to change fight you. And those in the middle are scared that change is going to mean they're going to lose something. Okay, so the majority of the organization when you're a change agent or when you're proposing something different or you're bringing something new to an organization is going to look with you with at least trepidation, if not downright um, fear. Okay, so fear of change, a very big issue. But that usually means that you need to have something that they're even more afraid of to use as a catalyst to get them to change, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then we run the risk that some of these partnerships actually end up perpetuating the silos. And this scares me a lot. So if we don't have that common standard of communication, the common agreement about you know, what's an inpatient case, what's an outpatient case, what's the right pathway for a clinician to treat a patient, if we don't have those agreements as, as not just an industry, but as the medical community, I think, also needs to agree <laughs> then we're going to end up having um, places of uniqueness, even though those places of uniqueness are, represent a broader territory. So building bigger partnerships that cover more providers and more payers and cover more issues is great, but say it's statewide. So instead of going from 1,000, you go to 50. That's good, but it's not where the industry needs to be, and we can't stop there. Um, and sometimes organizations aren't as ready to embrace risk as they think that they are. And so these partnerships can sometimes falter or stop or fail um, because they don't have the capital or they don't have the mindset or they don't have the courage or they, they realize, and, and how to say this, so it, it becomes the importance of what I'm doing today, okay? The importance of what I am doing today, it's working. You remember two canoes? How do I jump from fee for service to fee for value and balance at the same time two canoes? That's the problem. It's really hard to give up the cash flow and the profitability and the, and the return today but, and disrupt yourself potentially for something that's risky that's never been done. So the very success of the, um, of the healthcare industry in sustaining itself with all of its problems and challenges prevents us from moving forward with partnerships that would move us to the ideal healthcare state. Um, and I will also say, as I mentioned, it is much easier to drive change when you have a common enemy, when fear overwhelms greed and complacency. But we are actually making some progress. Um, and so, you know, rather than, I'm, I'm going to be the counterpoint to Norm, I'm actually going to leave you with a little bit of hope. Um, we're actually making great strides connecting people to the care they need and connecting the sites of care to each other and to them. And it's not just at United Health Group. I see that throughout this industry. I see those points of light that are connecting to each other. Um, we are seeing greatly renewed interest um, and commitment to strategic relationships that move healthcare to that transformed state. Um, AI and machine learning, you've heard an awful lot about it. I can't say enough about it other than to, you know, the potential that it has 
to bring us to a better state of health, to bring science back into medicine, to allow med those in medicine to also have time for once to give care to people. Um, and what we are actually seeing is that the clinicians and the health systems are embracing that opportunity as much, if not more than, the payer community is. Um, we get a lot of interest from health systems and physician practice companies wanting to be smarter, better, better connected, um, and have um, information in the workflow that will help them to deliver better care. And it's especially true for Medicare Advantage. And now, you know, I must say, we can actually now treat and cure conditions that were never thought possible before. Um, and that job of helping the physicians keep up with data-driven clinical advantage, advances and routing patients to specifically the right expert for patients like them, deeply personalized recommendations, um, is an area of very significant growth and partnership collaboration um, that we see. Um, growth in Medicare Advantage is one catalyst for this change because it actually creates incentives and room to have a risk margin that can be spread across the providers to change, to use that financial incentive to change behavior. And it also requires a different kind of patient interaction and expertise different practice models, data analytics, and other capabilities that move us towards this altered state. The biggest driver of collaboration, though, is that our time is running short. I stood here before you many times giving you the, the perspective of the movie critic, you know, the one who criticizes management for never having made the movie that they never intended to make in the first place, but not the actor or the producer. I'm not that movie critic anymore. I'm deep in the weeds on these partnerships and in this transformation. And I can tell you um, that when I stood here pointing out the flaws and successes as well as the opportunities healthcare had over the prior year, I've actually even offered you a few forecasts for the future. But the underlying message, as I thought back on it from the perspective of where I sit now, was always pretty much the same. Healthcare, fix yourself. If you don't, someone else will, and you will not like it very much. So that's the realist in me. But as I promised you, I would also be an optimist. And I think that every year, I've always tried to come back and tell you that no matter what the challenges we faced over the prior 12 months, there was a message of hope for at least the next 12 months. I still see and have for some time since I first showed it, showed it to you, that brilliant shining city on the hill that is a transformed healthcare system. It's the healthcare system that can be. It is a place where all care and all providers are connected and where we can leverage the best science and combine it with the natural compassion of clinicians and caregivers along with their own intellect and abilities to deliver the best possible care. And a place where the experience for everyone is simple, smart, and seamless where engaged patients flow through a logically orient, organized, streamlined local delivery system that leverages technology and relationships to connect people to exactly the right care for them. And social and supportive services are not an afterthought, but rather fully integrated into the human care plan that the healthcare system delivers. This would be a place where funding mechanisms, the how we pay for care, are sensible, efficient, and provide exactly the right incentives to all participants to make the right decisions, because we all know that money talks. Decisions that are, of course, supported by data and analytics, science and clinical judgment tempered by experience, and by the needs of the individual human in that last most important three feet away from the provider. 
This would be and is a place where people get the health care they need and can afford. A place where health care is indeed reimagined beyond anyone's expectations. I still see that place. And 325,000 of my colleagues and I are working every day to make that place real. But we're not doing it alone, nor can we. We are privileged and grateful to collaborate with, partner, and serve more parts of the healthcare economy than ever before. And that's what makes me believe that together, unified by a common vision and language, we can make that shining city on the hill real. We must, because the lives that you care about, that I care about, and all the others that we serve count on it. Thank you.